Verse 31. I counted up dozens of times where the Lord commands his people, I do not want you to kill. If you're shedding blood, that is Satan's plan. And that is not my way. In fact, in mm -hmm. section 98, there were 10, in, 10 times the Lord says, I don't want you to fight. I want you to proclaim peace. And then in section 103, we are a people of peace. And in section 105, in section 57, in section, and here it is beautifully in verse 31 of section 63, you are forbidden to shed blood. Um, the gift of life is the Lord's to give and to the Lord's to take away. And let us never interfere with either of those. I feel like the Lord has already set them up. If they would have followed his counsel, when you talked about the land of Zion, do you remember back up in verse 24, he says, don't come too fast. Um, you know, I don't want any confusion. I don't want any uh, pestilence. And we don't want to overwhelm the locals, you know, just do this in an orderly fashion. Yeah. If we would have followed that one thing, <laughs> it might have helped, you know, and uh, we meaning the bodies of the church. I don't know. And then, yeah. of course, as he comes down here, he's saying, when you're working with your neighbors, don't be angry with them. And these poor saints are so excited to get there. They're saying things like, oh, we're going to take over this whole area. This is going to be a new Jerusalem. We're getting rid of all of your houses of ill repute. We're getting rid of all your money making. You know, the Lord's going to change this. You know, we're taking over. That, that just didn't, didn't bite too well, let alone yeah. the differences on their religious feelings. And, you know, but economically, they, they really made some enemies. <laughs> and their political feelings. I mean, everything is opposite. You yeah, mentioned opposite. there about the shedding of blood and you, and you made a statement about don't, you know, that's the Lord's territory. That's interesting because just what, a few verses earlier, he had talked about adultery, which is giving life, which is also the Lord's territory, oh, right? I beautiful. remember Elder Holland talking about that. Surely, what does he say, John? You probably know better than me. Surely the things God cares about the most or how one gets into this world how one, and how one, one leaves. Gets out. Yeah. Okay. So when I was on my mission and we had to memorize word for word, our discussions, yes. uh, one of them about the commandments, I can still remember how we started that God has many powers and among the powers he values most is the power to give and to take life. He's forbidden us the power to take life, but it shared with us the power to create life by allowing us to bring spirits <laughs> wow. into the world. And I remember that, that same idea, the kind of the, um, mile posts along the plan of salvation, the way you are born, the way you die, and that he, those are important to him. And so I like that, Hank. You're for yeah. the bringing life into the world without his authorization or taking life without his yeah. authorization. Yeah. Uh, and it's God is the same, isn't he? He is. He's told for how long? Thou shalt yeah. not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Right. Yeah. It's just a consistent message. Yeah, and that's what I said. There, there's through. five of the ten commandments in this section, yeah. and if you go. A section before and a section after you get all 10. You know, you get a okay. few before and a few after you get all 10. Yeah. 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 All right. So yeah. I was going to mention just because I thought it was kind of interesting. The Lord's, uh, here's the Lord telling him to buy land. Well, doesn't the earth belong to you? And he says in yeah. verse 25, I, the Lord, hold it in mine own hands. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar. So he's like, I, listen, the whole earth is mine, but let's yeah. do this. Yeah. as not to overwhelm the locals. Like you said, I thought that was interesting. And in the same section, a few verses later, he's talking to our dear um, Newell K. Whitney, and he talks about his store. And then he says, I mean, the store, you know, it's not your yeah. store. You know, the stewardship is the Lord has given you a responsibility. It's not your store. It's not your land. It's the Lord's land. It's, you know, uh, I read right past that and didn't, Get the insight. <laughs> yeah. His store, or in other words, the store. The store. <laughs> That's in it's verse the 42. Lord's. Well, I just yeah. feel like the law of consecration is so important. And we can, I feel like I'm living it every day of my life as long as I'm remembering the gifts that God has given me are stewardships to build his kingdom. And whether that is um, going to work or whatever I'm doing in school or with my family or my neighborhood or my community, whatever I'm doing. You know, you have to have that mentality. I am a servant of God here trying to build his kingdom with my, with his gifts. We are just stewards. We are not right. owners of anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's go to verse 34. I've, I'm curious. Yeah, there about... is second coming right there. Yeah. There you go. Um, the saints also shall hardly escape, hardly escape. So he is warning them. This is not yeah. going to come easily. I, the Lord, um, am with them and I will come down from heaven and um, consume the wicked with unquenchable fire. But then in the next verse is the one I was referring to before where he says, but not yet. 
<laughs> don't think the second coming is um, in 1831. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but not yet. Um, by and by, as you mentioned before. Yeah. Um, but he goes on in even verse 37. I love this. Every man should take righteousness in his hands and faithfulness upon his loins and warning voice. I just want to mention one little thing about the fact that we self-correct in King James or biblical language whenever it says him. But I found this wonderful passage by Joseph. Do you remember the letter he writes in um, Liberty Jail that becomes section 121, 122, 123? So not the whole letter is canonized, but there is a portion of that letter where he says, now, brethren, and he says, by the way, when I say brethren, I mean men, women, and children. I mean disciples of Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, Joseph is our first feminist. You know, I, I feel like he really uh, is on board to help um, the sisters more than their culture did at that time. I'm glad you mentioned that. So that's it in just a part that's not in the Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, it's not in the Doctrine It's part of the letter that he wrote mm -hmm. yeah. out of Liberty yeah. Jail. And you can find it in Joseph Smith Papers project on, on dot org Joseph Smith papers .org. Yeah. awesome i'm gonna get that i love um also in this little section when he starts talking in verse 40 i want you to give as much money as you can to zion and these people were in on, on poverty row you know they were already giving away property and trying to get ready for other things i'm just i'm so um in awe at the generosity of these fast offerings of the way they were trying to live the law of consecration, you know? Yeah. Um, who, who is Titus Billings? Do we know much about him? You know, the thing that um, I remember is it was Morley's farm and um, he was called to go down to Missouri. And it says in one record that the, he didn't want to be tempted by too much materialism. And so he said, I'll just give it to Titus. Billings. And then Titus is the one who mm -hmm. oversees this land, but then Titus doesn't keep it. After a few months, the Lord says, okay, you need to sell this property now. Actually, if this is August 30th, the property is already being sold by September. Mm -hmm. Joseph leaves in September and Sydney leave to go down to the Johnson's farm. So, you know, even though uh, Titus has the property um, for a short period of time, he doesn't keep it. It's 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 the Lord's calling him to use to consecrate this land to go to Zion. Lynn, you're so great. You can take a section like this that I, I was like, oh, what are we going to talk about? And you're. you're like, oh, oh look well, at this, to look me, at this, look it at is this. just so powerful that it's such a great section on preparing for the millennium, because I feel like we are 200 years closer than they were. Um, or 190 years closer than they are. And the signs of the times are, I, I too have taught the book of Revelation repeatedly. And I feel like um, we, we can cut the calamities of the earth short if we would start following these commandments here in section 63 on how to establish a Zion people, how to prepare a Zion land and how to become um, ready for our, for our savior's return. 49 is another one that he's still talking about this. Blessed right. um, are those that die in the Lord. And of course, in that day and age, you know, you lose 50% of your kids before they're three years old. And, you know, death is oh, so much more common. Yeah. You're constantly in pain, whether it's a toothache or a, or a corn on your foot. You just don't know how to deal with things the same way, let alone strep throat and uh, cholera. You know, I just feel like they're constantly dealing with death in a, you know, Susan Eason Black always jokes that the, the, the best paid person in Nauvoo is the, oh, is the person who builds the coffins and takes care of you know, the mortician, you know? So in verse 49, this is actually the 20th time in this section that he's been talking about the millennium. And he continues on from verse 49, clear down to verse 54, where he starts talking about how old things will become new, that the Lord will come. And if we die in the Lord, we will be able to join him as well um, and inherit the holy city. And here's another verse where he uses the dual message of the holy city now on earth and the holy city yeah. there. It's just beautiful because I feel like with our 
prophet emphasizing the need to have our homes, temples, and our sacred spaces are um, all around us that we don't necessarily, and also even going back to President Kimball, you know, make Zion wherever you are, uh, don't necessarily have to um, come to a different country, but we see that counsel right here in verse 49 of section 63. But this is where we get the twinkling. This mm -hmm. is the section where we talk about you get twinkled at the age of a man at 72. You know, the thing you I just hear love about this. when you're a kid. Yeah. 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 This is verse uh, 51. You get mm -hmm. twinkled. And, and verse 53 is the, the verse I was looking for before speaking after the manner of the Lord. So don't get your hopes up if you think it's tomorrow, you know, mm. he, but the 10 virgins is the next verse. It's verse 54. That's where we get it. And it's just a short little clip on it, but he's already taught us that the oil is the spirit. And um, if you go back and look at the, the previous, um, you know, section 45, verse 36 and um, section 33, verse 17 and 18, he's already taught us a lot about how to interpret this scripture. And do you remember when Joseph Smith said, the way you understand a parable is by going back and looking at the question. What drew it out? Yeah. yeah. So I went back and looked at the, the virgins and the 10 virgins. And the question actually is in, is in Matthew 24. And it's um, tell us about the signs of your second coming. And so it fits in beautifully to this people who are trying to build Zion and who want to know how to become a Zion people. And they're so eager to learn. But of course, we're human. We're mortals. They've been baptized almost a year. You know, they, they have, we have a long ways to go. We're still working on it. Um, but here's that beautiful verse. And I think the thing that is um, sweet about in verse 54 about this parable that we can learn more about than we learn otherwise is that I will send my angels to pluck them out. So the Lord has his mighty forces, his hosts of the heavens uh, working um, the entire um, separation of the righteous and the wicked. Uh, is a is a process um but i just have to tell you as a child i was so offended by this parable weren't weren't you offended why don't they share why their can't oil they share? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah i was very grateful for we president were taught Kimball. to share right yeah mm -hmm. exactly so i was very grateful for president um kimball's talk you can't share a tithing slip how do you share yeah. a testimony um that you've been that you have become yeah. the gift of charity that you've worked on your whole life, you know, but I really feel like um, the, the saints are feeling day by day, drop by drop. We are becoming mm -hmm. more Christ-like um, our, our leaders are taking us there. Our scriptures are taking us there, but I feel come follow me is a giant step in um, helping us become. You, you used the word oil. become three times just yeah. now and when i try to teach that parable to my students i i say i, I remember um, president oaks has talked the challenge to become and mm -hmm. it's kind of i can't share share and you can't share what you've become i can't say i need 30 years of your honesty could you give that to me please <laughs> yeah. and that's yeah. why i i love that we that ever since that hearing that parable as a child and not getting why they don't share Things like President Kimball and Elder Oaks saying it's what you've become that it's not shareable. I um, I can't give you that. So thank you for for using that word. I love uh, that President yeah, Oaks too. talked about. It's not just what we know, and it's not even just what we do. It's what we've become. Mm -hmm. well, when I teach Matthew twenty five in the parable of the ten virgins, there's a there's a point that we skip over that I I really like. It's in uh, Matthew twenty five verse four. It says, "But the wise took oil in their vessels." with their lamps. So I've often related this to, and I, I don't know if the Savior meant it this way, obviously, but um, we've got our lamp in our oil, that's kind of seen by everybody else. And then we've got oil in our vessel, which is kind of private, right? Mm. No one else sees that. And so I, I think like well, you've got to have your public spirituality, right? That's important as being an example, let your light so shine, but you also need this private relationship. Amen. With the spirit. It cannot all just be a public relationship with, with God, Amen. right? Because uh, Lynn, I think you'd absolutely agree. 99.5% of what, <laughs> of what we experience with the divine is private, right? Mm. Um, I, I, to me, I, I want to have oil in the vessel that's, that's nobody knows about. 
Right, but me. And the Lord really, 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 really wanted these saints to know this parable. Yeah. Seven Evidently. times in the Doctrine and yeah. Covenants. Yeah. Evidently, we have a lot to learn from this. And even if I just look at the practices in the New Testament of what was required um, for a marriage ceremony and what they did, um, you know, the the background gives you light too. you know, you're you're coming in a happy, festive, joyous um experience to come to the bridegroom. And as we prepare for the Savior's coming, I really appreciate Elder Hinckley's reminder that it is a great and dreadful day of the Lord. And yeah. let us, I, I go back to what my brother said in my blessing for my eyes, rejoice in, you will see the hand of the Lord in your life. Don't, don't emphasize the, this, the sad, be of good yeah. cheer in your hardest times, you know? Yeah. I remember, um, one of my absolute favorite talks of general conference ever was 2005, uh, elder Bednar said, I gave a talk, mm -hmm. first talk in general conference for him was the tender mercies of the mm -hmm. Lord. Uh, and yeah. that talk to yeah. me, it changed everything. Um, yeah. for me, when it comes to, you can have peace, right? Knowing that you and the Lord are, are on the same page, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And in this difficult, difficult world that we face, you need that peace, uh, to know that, that the Lord is pleased with you. Yeah. That phrase has become part of our conversations. We talk about tender yeah. mercies now all the time ever yeah. since tender that talk. And it's always Lord. been a scriptural yeah. term, but yeah, mm -hmm. he brought he brought that to our awareness kind of. Okay, this is an intriguing story. Sidney Rigdon is supposed to write a description, right, yeah. of Zion. It doesn't go very well. The part I've underlined, his writing is not acceptable because I've had that kind of comment from Deseret Book a few times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, that's just a joke, but uh, oh, no. his it's writing, not a joke for me. I was listening to that. I was like, wait, what did you say? <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering, do we have his first draft of his description? Oh, wouldn't uh, that be a fun thing just to, to read? see? Why wasn't it very good? Or yeah, what was what wrong happened? with it? So the Lord I, gives him I another chance, I do not chance, know right? if we have yeah. that draft. Mm. I have no idea. Yeah. Many people are scared for the second coming. Um uh, and it's this uh, guy almost as a, as a, maybe a youth or as a parent, you're going, you know, this gives me anxiety. How would you, what would you say to someone who has a lot of anxiety over the second coming? I mean, we did talk about it being a great and dreadful day of the Lord. Anything else that you might add? When my little Peter was three years old, he was learning how to do mathematics and he thought it was so amazing that he could multiply anything times infinity and get infinity. Mommy, I know what, what? 572 times infinity is. You know, <laughs> you know, he was just so cute. And that's the way I feel about preparing for the second coming. We are, if we are joining with the savior, hmm. it doesn't matter. It's going to be tremendous. He is infinity. Anything we can give, anything we can do, if we are working on his team, if we are, as our prophet calls, on his battalion, you know, if we are serving God, if we are part of that going to Harry Potter, I just feel like the seventh book of Harry Potter, you know, we are fighting the dark arts. But if we are on Christ's team, our burdens will be made light and the things that we suffer will be put in perspective. And we have the perspective of infinity. We, anything that we do, will be made okay by God. I, I like that. I, and to let people know that, hey, we're kind of in the middle of it and you're doing good, right? Like, it's yeah. not like it's still out yeah. there. We're, we're yeah. well on the yeah, way. We're, fact, we're, we're well on the way. Yeah. I have a statement from Elder Holland that I've always uh, shown to students who say, uh, what, ha what will happen when the second coming is here, right? And I'll say uh, BYU speeches of September 12th, 2004, the promised second coming of the Savior began with the first vision of the prophet Joseph Smith in 1820. He was back, right? And we're in the middle of it right now. And, and we're doing great. We're doing great. Yeah, I've actually heard it referred to as second comings because there will be so many. And the first vision was maybe the first in, but how many more? And how many more were shared visions? I love that, that um, how that helps me to, to know that Joseph Smith was not the only one. There were others that shared visions of his other comings. Well, and even his mother 
saw the Lord um, way before Joseph was born. And hundreds and hundreds of other people saw the Lord before Joseph was born. So it was Joseph's first vision, but Hmm. the heavens had not been closed to many great um, people throughout the history of the world. The Lord has answered his disciples' prayers, regardless of which dispensation or if they are between dispensations, the Lord still, I feel, knows his children by name. You know, Joseph Sr. had his seven dreams and Asel, as well as Lucy Mack's dad, he doesn't um, become converted to the Savior until later in his life. But both of them felt like the Lord had um, come to them and spoke to them and given Mm. them um, great comfort and hope that they not only were part of his elect is how they um, described it in those days, but that they um, would have posterity that would also change and bless the world. Yeah. But you're referring to Asel's statement about Joseph or about his right. posterity, his right. posterity. His posterity. He, did, he posterity didn't know it was Joseph, but yeah. yeah. I, I feel like those two records, um, Asel's short, short, short message to his children, a few, a few dozen pages, and the little teeny pamphlet by um, Brother Mac are just beautiful examples of the religious enthusiasm of the age and the sincerity of these um, disciples of Christ that filled New England at that time. Let's look at this verse 57. This is one that I noticed. He said, Verily I say unto you that those who desire in their hearts in meekness to warn sinners to repentance, let them be ordained unto this power. Um, what it, When I looked at that, I thought, you know, there there is a, a a side of us that wants to kind of lash out and say yeah. repent, right, or or suffer. Um, but what do you think the word when he says those who desire to in their hearts in meekness to warn sinners to repentance? Um, how do you walk that line? Do you think of of yes, I want to be truthful, I want to help, but meekness seems. John, what did you call meekness? Great. Great power under complete control. One of our uh, S. Michael Wilcox gave a, an article about the Beatitudes, and he he uh, phrased it that way, or he heard it phrased that way. I love the way Joseph combines the idea of power and meekness. Well, the Lord taught Joseph in in Liberty Jail: no power or authority can or ought to be maintained except by meekness, long-suffering, patience. So if we want to facilitate God's power, and I'm using this very broad term of God's priesthood power here, because Joseph has just said a few paragraphs in that letter difference. When I say brethren, I mean men and women and children. So if we want to access God's power in our life, which is God's priesthood, then we have got to do it through gentleness, meekness, and love unfeigned. So I feel like God's power can only be accessed if we're going to do it with his key and his key is meekness. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What did just, let's see if I can get this quote, right. You guys will help me. Uh, he says, uh, when pers- when persons manifest the least kindness and love to me, mm-hmm. Oh, what great power it has over my heart. While the opposite course has a tendency to harrow up harsh feelings and yeah. depress the human mind. I mean, that's just absolutely beautiful. And I've been on, I've done both. I've done the loving side. I've done, I've gone too harsh. uh, And he's exactly right. It's uh, our general conference. Um, Mm -hmm. Elder Stevenson talked about kindness with the rabbits, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then after that, Elder Gong talked about kindness as well. And I've heard the phrase a million times. And I think in missionary work, people don't care how much you know. Until they know how much you care, that, that maybe this is part of that warning and meekness. Um, uh, and also, Hank, you've talked about, we've all talked about repentance and Elder Holland saying it's the most hopeful and encouraging word in the whole Christian vocabulary. And I've, when I've taught my students, I say, if I say repent, put in the chat window, the first word that comes to your mind, it's usually not hope, encouragement, you know. <laughs> right. Anyway. My daughter yeah. says repentance is self-love. She was in high school and she said repentance is self-love. Oh, I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Repentance is self-love. Yeah. We have a commandment to improve. <laughs> That's not a bad commandment, right? No, no. Yeah, no. verse 58, this is a day of warning and not a day of many words. Second time he's repeated that in this section. 
uh, is he saying, hey, be quick about it <laughs> because you don't have a lot of time? Well, I'm convinced that um, if it is a day of warning and the gospel has been restored, and if we are servants of God, when we are baptized, we put on his jersey and we work for on his team. And sometimes my prayers, I forget that. And I say, hey, could you help me? And could you do this and this and this? But it's actually, oh, I'm your servant. Uh, what should I be doing today? You know, I mean, I just feel like, so it's a day of warning. That means that's our job. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I remember uh, one of my favorite quotes about the second coming, and it just, it always comes back to me when I think of it, um, is the second coming is not a day of choosing. It is a day you find out what you have chosen. Right. This is before all this takes place before. And I, I like that. I, I think that fits. Mm -hmm. It's not a day of choosing. The second coming is, you know, when it's right in front of you, that's not the choosing's over. What would uh, President Monson say? When the time for decision has come, the time for preparation is past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is from, it's called preparation for the second coming. Uh, President Oaks um, in April of 2004. And he says, and I, I use, I would, I sometimes use this in my class. What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew we would meet the Lord tomorrow, you knew it tomorrow through our premature death or through his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? What accounts would we settle? What forgiveness would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? And then you sit on that for a minute. If it was really true, if I knew for a fact the Lord is coming tomorrow, what would I do today? And then he says this, if we would do all those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps of preparation, going back to the parable of the 10 virgins, are drawn down, let us draw, start immediately to replenish them. And you can do that at any time. You can start immediately to replenish your lamp. You don't have to, you don't have to wait. You don't have to go, you know, see the bishop before you, you can just fall down on your knees or you can open the scriptures and start replenishing that lamp. He says, yes, we need to make both temporal and spiritual preparation for the events of the prophesied second coming. He says this, a 72-hour kit of temporal supplies may prove valuable for earthly challenges, but as the foolish versions learn to their sorrow, a 24-hour kit of spiritual preparation is of greater and more enduring value. Um, so to me, I, when I read this section, Lynn, one thing I'm hearing is act now. Act now. Yeah. Do the things yeah. that you know you should be doing now. That's beautiful. Start. Thanks. You know, start con making confessions and con discontinuing practices and settle accounts and offer forgiveness, bear testimony. Let's get started today. I, I love the way he combines this. It's one of the Ten Commandments, not to use the Lord's name in vain in verse 60 to 63 or so. But I feel like it's, it's also um, a sin of commission and a sin of omission. And the way he says in verse 62, those who use the name of the Lord and use it in vain having not authority. I think of the way I close my prayers. Am I adding on the Savior's name to complete the prayer? Or am I using his name in an honorary and humble and meek hmm. um, fashion of referring to the Savior who has redeemed us? Um, I love the idea that if I am a baptized member of the church, even if I'm not serving as a full-time missionary, am I using his vain, name in vain? Because I have taken his name upon me. And if I am using my time inappropriately, or if I'm using my thoughts in a negative way, or if I'm allowing um, other priorities to come into my life, whether it's worldliness or just sloth, <laughs> whatever you want to choose. Um, am I using the name of the Lord in vain? I just think it has such a beautiful, broad application beyond just um, perhaps addressing our Savior in non, uh, the name of our God in a non holy context. It also has this far reaching application of when we are uh, ever addressing our Lord or representing our Lord. Is it from the heart? Mm. Thank you. I, I look at verse 64 in that same spirit. Remember that which cometh from above is sacred and must be spoken with care. And 
Hank and I love to laugh and we joke a lot when we're with one another. And yeah. and I I hope, though, that we're appropriate when it comes to things like this because because uh, of that commandment. So I'm I'm thankful I heard Truman Madsen once say there's a difference between being light minded and light hearted. Um, so I hope, I hope we're getting that right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I walk that line. I try to walk that line, uh, pretty well. I've had moments where the spirit has said, whoa, 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 you know, too, too much. Uh, but I, you know, cause we, what does the Lord say? Be, you know, rejoice, be happy, right? We're, we're going to be rejoicing, be edified together. Um, so I, I like that they're, they're sacred, mm. must be spoken with care, um, but, you know, it's not just using the name of the Lord, although I do think perhaps the most important part of our prayer is the closing phrase that we use, mm-hmm. bidding our Savior to take the message to our Father. But I also feel like um, it's such a powerful way to open up um, access to the Spirit is when we do not use the Lord in vain. That when we address Him and when we think of mm-hmm. Him, it is... Um, with great sincerity, then we are not using. So when we finish our statements in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, we could do that in vain if we're not careful. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah. I I, Um, I feel like I have, I have not been as careful as I could have been sometimes. Me too. Or as respectful. Um, I, um, I remember one student, um, left me a voicemail and finished the voicemail that way. <laughs> and then she said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was saying. And then she just hung up. So it always made me laugh. Um, you must be a scary teacher. Yeah. I, I, I <laughs> testimony. Um, also, I would say when we take the Lord's name upon us in our covenants, we can also do that in vain. Right? Yes. We can take yeah, the exactly. Lord's name in vain. I think you talked mm-hmm. about having that jersey on and let's not do that in vain, yeah. Yeah. right? Without yeah. meaning it. Yeah. Well, I think the backdrop of all of this is really helpful for the section to mm-hmm. see what's going on there. They want to know everything they can about Zion, um, uh, but they're not perfect. And the Lord has some reminders for them. In some places, sounding gentle; in other places, not very gentle. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. And then all of this millennium stuff, which is which is great, and the parables. Any, yeah, An inheritance yeah. before the Lord in the holy city. So, if if you die, you can still live in the holy city. Maybe, as you said, on another level. I want to bring up one last topic before we close this section, Lynn, and that is. He just says this in verse 66, but I think it's, it can be just an important and peaceful and wonderful principle. These things remain to overcome through patience, that such may receive a more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory, otherwise a greater condemnation. So overcome through patience. I, I don't know about either of you, but patience has been it's one of the one. most difficult Christ-like attributes for me to, to me to make progress on, right? I feel like I've I've got it. I've got it. And then I'm, oh, right. Something happens and it all blows up. And then I feel like, oh, I've got it. I'm really becoming more and more patient and something happens. Um, How have, Lynn, can you make me patient like you? (laughs) No, no, Um, no, no. And I don't know if I want to pray for patience, right? Because that that might end up with. (laughs) Well, for me, it's more of a matter of trusting God's I feel like timing. No, no, a little bit different than that, because I feel like sometimes God's timing is my preparation. So I have got to accelerate my learning, not say when I think of waiting on the Lord, I like to think of a um, I lived in Paris. I like to think of a a, a server waiting there for me. You know, I'm, I'm there to take notes on exactly everything you want. You know, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm ready to serve you. But the Lord's timing is so often my preparation. So if I can just step back and say, what do you want me to learn? Then I can be more patient because then I can do something about it. If, if I don't have any ability to move forward, then I feel like the early Puritans where you're just paralyzed into saying, okay, am I chosen or not? You know, am I one of the elect or not? You know, but God wants us to act and not be acted upon. So for me, patience is easier when I say, what can I learn? 
How can I, I want to be able to grow my seed while I am waiting. If you're waiting on me to blossom, I've got to add some miracle grow here. You know, help me increase my faith or whatever. Yeah. You know? So I feel like I can increase my patience easier when I just trust God. Yeah. It's going to be just fine. Yeah. Just trust God. It's a matter of faith and hope. And, and um, I, I totally can trust God. And then I can wait as long as I'm, I'm actively learning. I don't mind being patient. Now, a red light is a different story, but yeah. Yeah. Lynn, thank you for saying what you did about just trusting God, because I think there was an, in 1995, Elder Richard G. Scott gave this mm, talk yes. about how our questions change. Mm -hmm. And instead of asking, why is this happening? Or why is God doing this to me? Or what have I done to deserve this? When we really trust God, our questions become, and you said it, what am I supposed to learn? Uh, who can I help? Uh, how can I keep my faith in this time? And it, I love what you said. It gives us, it's a, it, proactive. It gives us something to do. You know, I'm, I'm in the midst of a trial. I'm going to try to be patient, but what can I learn during this time? Yeah. And I saw the word patience there too. And I thought of section four, the doctrine and covenants mm -hmm. that the missionary section, we often call it, you know, yeah. that speaks of patience and and Hank, I'm with you sometimes. I'm, well, wait a minute. I thought we're supposed to have a sense of urgency. And then other times, oh, and be patient. And uh, which one is it? You know, don't use many words, but be patient in meekness. I guess that's uh, one of those where thankfully we have the gift of the Holy Ghost that can apply to individual mm -hmm. circumstances, I suppose. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, for me, patience, I remember... There was a, another, there's a talk from Elder Uchtdorf on patience. There's another talk mm -hmm. from a, a, a general authority, Robert. He was the military. Do you guys remember? He Oaks. Was the, Robert, Robert C. Oaks. Oaks. Yeah. There was yeah. another talk by Robert C. Oaks on patience. And I listened to those over and over <laughs> and over <laughs> trying to just like soak it in, like help me become more patient. And you know what? Looking back over a long period of time, I can see that I've made that improvement. It's those you know, day to day, week to week, like, oh, why am I not making improvements? I remember Elder, or uh, yeah, it was Elder Oaks, but this was Robert Oaks, who um, he said that his, one of his friends had owned a motorcycle shop. Do you guys remember this story? And one of his sons, they had lined up brand new shiny motorcycles. And one of his sons thought he'd jump on the first one and start it up. So he did, and then pushed his luck too far and decided oh. to turn it off. And he jumped off the motorcycle and knocked a, it into the next one, which knocked it into the next one, the next oh, one, the next no. one, denting oh, all of no. them, denting all of them with the paint and, you know, the chrome. Uh, denting it all. Oh. And uh, he looked over at his dad, right? And his dad uh, kind of looked over the, his desk mm -hmm. like, and he said, well, we better fix one up and sell it so we can pay to fix the rest of them. Um, and that yeah. was about it. That was about it. And I thought, okay. I've got to get that down. I've got to get that down, right? Overcome through patience. Oh, let me know when you do that and then come and give me lessons. Okay. okay I will. <laughs> I will. Yeah. I just quit the motorcycle business altogether. Uh, <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, but I love those examples of, of Christ-like mm. patience. All right. Uh, Lynn, anything else in the section before we, anything we didn't cover that you're like, oh, Hank, we got to hit this or. I am just amazed as I think about how applicable each verse of this section is to those saints in 1831. And yet, as I read it on my own, in conjunction with Come Follow Me, each verse was very applicable to me. You yeah. know, it is, it, the scripture has this wonderful transporting ability. Um, if you want to hear God's voice, take a quiet, sacred hour and spend it in the scriptures and you will find messages just for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Lynn, what, what, what keeps you on the covenant path? What has this restoration and gospel done for, for you personally? You know, I believe because of the witness of the spirit that I first started feeling when I was seven years old, when I asked and again, every other time that I have asked and sought in humility. But the thing that keeps me with my toes deep in the sand and my roots growing down deeper is um, 
I, I, I really like comparing what is different about the Book of Mormon's message on patience rather than the biblical message on patience. And what do I believe this compared to our other Christian friends or colleagues or the Judaic or the Islamic faith traditions? And I am blown away at the truth and validity of not only the doctrines, but the principles and the way that is carried out in our church. I believe, as Eugene England said, the church is as true as the gospel. Mm -hmm. So I believe from a witness of the spirit, but my taproot comes from studying the scriptures and comparing them. Yeah. That is wonderful. Oh. John, um, another episode of Follow Him has uh, come and gone. Uh, and isn't it wonderful that we get to be here? What did Peter say? It is good for it us. It is good, good for us good to, to, be be here. Here. to be here. Understatement of all time. <laughs> Uh, but I, lo I love that he, that he would say that because, and I think for our young people, they'll, I love to tell, have you ever had the opposite? I shouldn't be here. Well, you know yeah. what to do. Yeah. Stand in holy places. I mean, get out of there. Yeah. Um, but for Peter to say that, and I feel like that every week and thank you, Lynn. I am so excited to go to Book of Mormon Central and Doctrine and Covenant Central and, and listen to more of your enthusiasm yeah. and excitement for this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just honored to have been here with you. It's been a sheer joy. Anytime we can testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a good day. It's a good day. It is. I, Thank I you. That. And you know what I love too about you, Lynn, is you have gone to not church schools to get all of your degrees. Did I get yeah. that right? All of them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and added that perspective to it. Mm -hmm. And I just I, I love that. I think it adds some yeah, some depth does. to our guests. And to yeah. what they've said, uh, what they've shared. Yeah. So yeah. thank you thank for, you. for your preparation and for yeah. being here. Wonderful. Well, God bless you both. Thank you for this invitation. We want to thank Dr. Lynn Wilson for joining us today. We want to thank all of you for listening and taking your time to be with us. We're grateful for your support. We really are. Uh, thank you to our executive producers, Steve and Shannon Sorensen. Our production crew, David Perry, Lisa Spice, Jamie Nielsen, Kyle Nelson, Will Stoughton, and Maria Hilton. And we hope you'll join us next time on Follow Him. <laughs>